Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Alhamdulillah, hamdan kathiran, tayyiban, mubarakan fi kama yuhibbu rabbuna wa yarda. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyin Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Amma ba'du. Alhamdulillah, thank you guys for joining me this evening for another Friday night khutbah recap. Alhamdulillah. So I don't know if you guys had an opportunity to listen to the khutbah today uh, to understand what the topic was. The topic was holding on to the Quran and Sunnah, holding on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the Quran and Sunnah. So it kind of like took me back a little bit to some talks that we used to give back in the early 2000s. Back in the early 2000s, alhamdulillah, we, uh, you know, put a lot of emphasis on sticking to the Quran and the Sunnah, holding tight to the Quran and the Sunnah, the methodology of the Salaf, the methodology of the Sahaba. There were a lot of a lot of talks, a lot of emphasis on those type of, you know, topics because of, you know, the necessity. Uh, and uh, I kind of feel myself going back to that space, considering everything that is going on in the Muslim community, the African-American Muslim community in more particular. Uh, so I'm kind of like digging back into that bag, digging back into the bag of the Quran and the Sunnah and being heavy on sticking close to Islam, you know, and this, and much of it is out of fear. Much of it is out of fear. My fear, much like the fear that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I mean, I'm not nowhere near the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm not, I don't want anybody to misconstrue what I'm saying, but I'm saying as a leader in the, in the community, you don't have the luxury of thinking on the same level that everybody else is thinking. You, you don't have that luxury as a leader. As a leader in the community, you have to always stay five steps ahead of everybody else. And so I'm, I'm saying that so people, so you guys can have a better understanding of some of the things that I say, some of the decisions that I make, some of the moves that I make. You know, sometimes it may seem like it's out of character. Sometimes it may seem like it's very sporadic. Sometimes it may even seem like it clashes or conflicts with, you know, what we know from Islam. But I'm, I do those things because I don't have the luxury of seeing the community from the from the lens that you see it. I don't have the luxury to be in the moment that you are in. I have to be five years from now. So I want you guys to think about that. Everything that I'm saying right now, I'm saying this right now because I'm five years ahead of you guys. You guys, are, some of you guys, are, you know, you may have your finger on the pulse, but I'm saying to you, I am five years ahead of you. Right now, you guys are in 2024. I am in 2029 already. I'm in 2029 already. I'm thinking ahead of where I see our communities going potentially, potentially, you know, potentially going, you know, if the if the conditions remain as they are. So a lot of what you hear me saying, a lot of what you see me doing is because I am looking at our community from a lens that is, you know, that is a couple of years ahead. And so while you may look at it and say, oh, what is he talking about? This is crazy. I'm thinking five years ahead because I see where this is going. I see where this is going. I, I mean, like you, you have to understand. And I want you guys, if you, if you can do anything for the Muslim community is to try to think outside the box. Try to think outside the box. Everybody doesn't have that potential. Everybody doesn't have that. That is a skill. Sometimes it is divine intervention. Um, you know, if you've been in that realm and functioning in that realm long enough, sometimes it just comes natural. You just automatically thinking a little bit ahead of everybody else. You know, if you want to do the Muslim community a favor, 
try to think and see our situation from where you're standing, from where you're sitting, you know, just a few years ahead from now. That if this, if this continues the way that it is years from now, where do you predict that this is going to be? And this is this should be the, the plight of every leader, every student of knowledge, every well, not every student of knowledge, not every imam, because they don't necessarily see themselves as leaders. A leader is one of one. Make no mistake about that. A leader is not something that somebody crowns you or dons you a leader. That is something that you take upon yourself due to the need and the necessity that is right in front of you. As Abu Bakr who he didn't want to be the Khalifa, he didn't want to be the leader of the Muslims. But when the Prophet Sallallahu died and people were apostating from Islam, people were talking about not paying zakat, Abu Bakr saw it as a duty upon himself to step in that space. Saw it as a duty on himself to step in that space. But Abu, Abu Bakr radiallahu who if you know anything about his character, if you do a character profile on Abu Bakr, you will see that he was never the person that wanted to be in the forefront. Always very humble, very quiet, only spoke when it was necessary. Wealthy, always putting his money where, you know, where his heart was. That was Abu Bakr the Siddiq, not the person that's in the forefront that give the leadership to me. I want to be, you know, that that wasn't his place. That that wasn't Abu Bakr's character. But when the Prophet Sallallahu died and he saw this vacuum, he knew that he had no other choice but to fill that void. To fill that void. All arrows were pointing to him. And so a leader is not, you know, someone who waits for somebody else to say, hey, he's the leader. No, a leader is someone is self-initiated, self-initiated. This is a person who takes it upon himself to grab the community by the reins and take a position that would put him at odds with most of the people that, you know, are in the community because they don't see the vision. You know, so I'm just saying that so you guys have a better understanding of where I'm coming from, where a lot of other imams or students of knowledge are coming from, you know, so that you don't you don't buy into, you know, the trickery of shaitan into making you think that this guy has, you know, lost his mind or this guy is doing this or saying this. This is this guy is going astray. He's losing it. No, no. This guy is speaking from a time zone that you haven't actually arrived at yet. Speaking from a time zone that you haven't even arrived at yet. And so the title of the khutbah today was holding on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Quran and the Sunnah. The Quran, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I started off the khutbah with a quote from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that was narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas. Who said that the Prophet ﷺ said, Taraktu fikum ayyuhannas ma'i'tasamtum bihi falantu dhillu ba'di abadan. Kitab Allahi wa sunnat al The Prophet ﷺ said, O people, I have left you with two things. O people, I have left you with two things. If you hold tight to those two things, you will never go astray after me. You will never go astray after me. And that is the book of Allah and the sunnah of his prophet. The book of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the sunnah of his prophet. Okay. Give me one second. Can you guys on Instagram hear and see? Can you guys on Instagram hear and see? All 
Okay. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he said that I have left you two things. O oh people, I have left you two things. If you hold tight to those two things, you will never go astray after me. And that is the book of Allah and the sunnah of his prophet. And these two sources represent what is called the Sirat al-Mustaqim. And this was something that I highlighted in the khutbah that many of our lifestyles contradict. Some of us, we are walking contradictions. Walking contradictions, meaning our entire lives are a contradiction to the very guidance that we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for in every salah. You do know that your salah is not accepted without Surah Al-Fatiha. For Surah Al-Fatiha is the bare minimum of what you have to recite in your prayer in order for your prayer to be considered valid. And in Surah Al-Fatiha, which is the greatest surah in the Quran, in Surah Al-Fatiha, there is a verse where we say, Ihdina sirat al mustaqim O Allah, guide us to the straight path. Then in the very next ayat, it's clear what that straight path is. Sirat al an'amta alayhim. The, the straight path upon which you have bestowed your blessings. The straight path upon which you have bestowed your blessings. This is what we say in every salah. We're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to the straight path. The sirat al-mustaqim, as the scholars explain, is the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the straight path. But then, as soon as we make the taslim, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, we get up out of our prayer and our lives is a contradiction to everything that we just asked for. And I want you guys to think about that. That if your life is a contradiction to the very guidance that you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for in every prayer, then you have to ask yourself, then what is the purpose? What is the purpose of the prayer? What is the purpose of the prayer when we're going to just get up, go about our daily lives, which is in total contradiction to the very guidance that we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for? I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up. And so, I go on to mention a verse from Surah to nisa Surah to nisa Surah number 4, ayat 174. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Ya ayyuhan nas, O people, qad ja'akum burhanu min rabbikum. There has come to you clear proof from your Lord. Burhanu min rabbikum. Has come to you clear proof from your Lord. Wa anzalna ilaykum nuran mubina. And we have revealed to you Clear guidance. Clear guidance. Uh, you guys on Instagram, can you hear and see? I don't know. It looks like it's, it's going in and out. It's freezing. Can you guys on Instagram... Okay, so I go on to mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah number four, ayat 174, O mankind, indeed there has come to you clear proof from your Lord, <laughs> clear proof from your Lord, and I have sent down to you nuran mubina, clear guidance, clear, clear light, a light that is clear, which is the Qur'an. He said, فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا And those who believe, وَاَعْتَصَمُوا بِهِ And those who hold tightly to Allah. The word here is اِعْتِصَام. Okay, so let me, let me just restart on, on Instagram. Let me just restart it. And you guys on Facebook, you can hear well. Okay, great.
Okay, give me one second. Okay, so we're also streaming live on YouTube as well. So if you guys are having a problem on any of the uh, platforms, then you can also go to um, you can go to YouTube Live, inshallah ta'ala, and you can follow along on YouTube. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And as for those who believe, billahi, those who be as for those who believe in Allah, wa'atasamu bihi, and they hold tightly to Allah. فَيُدْخِلُهُمْ فِي رَحْمَةٍ وَفَضْلٍ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enter them into his mercy as well as his grace. وَيَهْدِيهِمْ إِلَيْهِ صِرَاطًا مُسْتَقِيمًا And he will guide them to himself by the straight path. Guide them to himself by the straight path. So in this ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about what is called اِعْتِصَامٍ Li'irtisam means to hold tightly to something. And usually when i'tisam is used, it's used in holding tightly to the Quran and the Sunnah. It's usually connected to holding tightly to the Quran and the Sunnah. Al-I'tisam bil kitabi wa sunnah. Holding tightly to the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet. But here Allah uses it in terms of holding tightly to him. And the scholars say Al-I'tisam, holding tightly to something is two types. It is the i'tisam billah. It is holding tightly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by putting your trust in him, tawakkulu alayhi, putting your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, believing in him, increasing in your, your knowledge of him, that is holding tight, tightly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there's al i'tisam bil kitabi wa sunnah, holding tightly to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So al i'tisam, i'tisam, uh, no'an. Al-i'tisam billah wa al-i'tisam bil kitabi wa sunnah Holding tightly to Allah and holding tightly to the book and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Taraktukum ala mahajjat al-bayda Layluha ka nahariha la yazigu anha illa halik That I have left you upon a clear white path None seeks to go to the to go around it. La yazigu anha. No one seeks to go around the path that I have left for you, except you are going to destroy yourself. And so, what we see in today's time, in recent times, in today's time, many Muslims seeking a version of Islam that coincides with their desires. They don't want the Islam that the that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed to His Prophet and to the the believers. People want, Muslims want the version of Islam that coincides with their desires. That makes it easy for them to still be who they are and still call themselves Muslim. They want to be who they are, but they still want to be called Muslims. It doesn't, Islam doesn't work like that. You don't get to come into the religion and then manipulate the religion and shame and condemn and blame and find fault until you can get you know, the religion to conform to your desires. It doesn't work like that. People are looking for a version of Islam that is palatable, palatable to their desires. And it doesn't work like that. So when this person corrects you, oh, this is too harsh. Oh, this is too extreme. Oh, this is person is doing the most. This person is doing this. This is too much. That's why I don't go to that masjid. That's why I don't go here. And then they'll box themselves in until they are around a certain group of Muslims or within a certain community space that allows them to be them. That allows them to be them. And when you think about the Sahaba, they didn't have the luxury 
of converting to Islam and still being who they wanted to be and separating themselves from the community of the Prophet Sallallahu and going to some remote place with a, a, a bunch of group of Muslims who were just like them, who just still wanted to do them. They didn't have that luxury. They wanted to be around the Prophet Sallallahu They wanted to be a part of the Muslim community. And they knew that the only way that that could happen was that they had to make some changes to themselves. Right. We usually want to hang around. How many Muslims listening right now, majority of your friends are non-Muslim. And you use that as an excuse. The reason That's the reason why I don't hang out with Muslims. That's the reason why I don't mess with Muslims. And then majority of your friends are non-Muslims. Many of your non-Muslim friends, you know, drink, smoke, you know, are promiscuous. You know what I mean? Like they're not righteous non-Muslim friends. These are non-Muslim friends that are calling you to the hellfire. Calling you to hell. But you feel more comfortable being around them than you do being around Muslims. And then the, the first thing we will cite is the dysfunction. <laughs> the dysfunction of the Muslim community. Oh, the Muslim community is dysfunctional. You know, I don't want to be almost as if you are like, like <laughs> you're impervious to what you see going on. The dysfunction in the Muslim. Everybody got a little bit of dysfunction with them. We're Americans. Since when did dysfunction not become a part of our maturation process. <laughs> we're, we're Americans. Our whole life is about being dysfunctional. Trump is wearing a hat that says make America great again. When was America great? From the onset. When was America great? The people who came here and took the land from the natives and the aboriginals were criminals from, from Europe. Shipped here and sent here, you know, from because they didn't want to pay taxes to the king or they didn't want, to, you know, or the king didn't want them there. So they sent them here to America. They came here, pillaged, raped, brought all types of diseases here to the natives. And then you think that and then, of course, they bought slaves here. And they, you know, started this slave route, slave trade and, you know, built up America to only have this dysfunctional president come along and say, Make America great again. When was America great? I'll wait. Please tell me, when was America ever great? How do you define greatness? Please tell me. How do you define when white people were on top? White people are always going to be on top. You've mastered the system. It's your system. It's your system. So by those standards, America is still great. By those standards, America is still great. What do you mean when you say make America great again? When was America ever great? I'll wait. But you have Muslims today who hang with non-Muslims because they cite the dysfunction in the Muslim community as the justification for doing so. Oh, the Muslims over there are dysfunctional. They toxic. They're this. They're that. As if to say the non-Muslim friends that you hang with are not toxic. The only reason why you don't see their toxicity is because, you know, they overlook, they y'all overlook one another's flaws, flaws and mistakes, and y'all all toxic together. You're all toxic together. But name me a space where there's no dysfunction. We all have dysfunction in our families and our school system. But Muslims will highlight these things as excuses and justifications not to be around the Muslims. And that that, de that detachment from Islam is what creates this idea that Islam is, you know, people be doing the most, Muslims be doing the most. And, you know, I'm looking for this version of Islam that is palatable. It's palatable to my desires. I can still be me. I can still do me and still call myself Muslim. And so they remove these two fundamental elements of our religion from the deen. They remove the Quran and they remove the Sunnah. Not necessarily in statement, but in action. They don't act upon it. They don't recognize it. They don't acknowledge it. They don't adhere to it. But they'll still say, I'm Muslim. But you do ev everything that you do is a contradiction to the very same principles you say you believe in. I don't know. This is 
I'm a black and white type of person. So I don't, I don't, I, I mean, make it make sense for me. How do you call yourself a Muslim following, ask, and you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you to the straight path. Every salah, in every raka'ah, in every salah, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem, guide us to the straight path. And then you turn around and you live a lifestyle that is in total contradiction to the very thing that you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. Make it make sense. And the thing about it is that if we want to be successful as Muslims, then we have to look at the first generation of Islam because they were successful. They literally pulled themselves out of the mud by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, pulled themselves out of the mud. These were people who came from a very dysfunctional environment, as I mentioned in my last discussion. Arab, Pre-Islamic Arab society was a dysfunctional environment from the way that they dealt with their children to the way that they dealt with their wives. Very misogynistic, very chauvinistic, very patriarchal, very domineering, very oppressive towards the weak. All throughout the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing you know, pre-Islamic Arab culture. And it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing Arab culture because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was an Arab. But that type of behavior existed in every culture. In just about every culture. You had double standards. You had this, you know, uh, hierarchy within the society. The rich and the, the, the middle class and the lower class that existed in every society. But these people came from a dysfunctional environment, converted to Islam understood the mission of Islam, understood the standards of Islam, and they begin slowly to change themselves to conform to the standards. To conform to the standards. Whereas in today's time, we convert to Islam for those, for those of us, excuse me, who convert to Islam, and then those of us who are born and raised in a religion, it's, it's even worse because those who are born and raised in a religion, they are getting a version of Islam from their parents that is, you know, obviously intolerable for many of them. Their parents are extreme. Parents are either one extreme or the other. They're either super duper religious and overly critical of everything that they do or just completely heedless and negligent. And then the Muslim children that come out of those environments come out of those environments with a disdain. And a disassociation from Islam. Stop me when I'm lying. Many of you who were born and raised Muslim, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not protect you and guide you, many of you, you have a disdain for Islam because of what you saw from your parents. It's not Islam. It was your parents' version of Islam. And then there are many of us who converted to Islam and, you know, we look at the religion and we're like, okay, uh, that's a bit much for me. And, you know, I want to remain who I am. So how can I navigate my way through this religion without having to change much about myself? I love myself how I am. I mean, the Sahaba, they hated who they were. The Sahaba, they hated the evil that they had with them. Hudayfa, he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, kunna fil jahiliyyatin wa sharr, wa ja'ad Allahu biha dil khair. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we were in jahiliyyah, we were in a state of pre-Islamic ignorance and evil. Wa ja'ad Allahu biha dil khair. And Allah brought us this good of Islam. That's the way they used to look at where they came from. They didn't look at Islam with disdain. They looked at where they came from with disdain. Whereas we do the total opposite. Because we are so dysfunctional, we convert to Islam still celebrating jahiliyyah, still celebrating the pre-Islamic ignorant state that we came from while finding fault with Islam. That's a fact. The Sahaba عنهم, converted to Islam and they had a disdain from where they came from. And they saw Islam as the solution to their problems. 
Whereas we convert to Islam today and we convert to Islam with disdain in our eyes for Islam while still celebrating the dysfunctional environment that we, that we came from. Evidenced by the fact of what? Evidenced by the, the pre-Islamic ignorance that we bring with us into the religion that we don't change. We don't change. Look at the certain Muslims that have been Muslim 5, 10, 15 years. And it's the same ignorance. <laughs> Nothing about them has changed in terms of their behavior, in terms of their character, in terms of the way that they carry themselves, and in terms of, in terms of the way that they present themselves to the world. Not, not much about them has changed. Not much about them has actually changed. So you ask yourself, if you convert to a religion like Islam that kind of demands change, how, do, how are you able to navigate your way throughout the years in the religion without changing much? I, I, that's a question I want you to ask yourself. It's like a, a child that doesn't know how to read, that is illiterate by the third grade. How in the world do they make it to the 12th grade? How does a child make it through the school system, push through the school system to arrive at the 12th grade and dumb as a doorknob? How did that happen? How did that happen? How did they manage to navigate their way through 5th grade, 6th grade, 7th grade, 8th grade, 9th grade, 10th grade, 11th grade? They're getting ready to graduate and they're still reading on a 7th grade level, 8th grade level. How? How did that happen? The same way a Muslim can convert to Islam and then five years, ten years into being Muslim and they've managed to navigate their way ten years into Islam and not much about them has changed. How did that happen? How did that happen? How are you Muslim ten years and not much about you has actually changed? And you, you pray five times a day? Five times a day you pray? Fast the month of Ramadan, 30 days? That doesn't mean that they're dumb. Have you taken a look at our society? Have you not seen the way that these kids drive? They don't read signs. They don't follow laws. They don't, they, have you not seen... How you walk into a restaurant and there's a young person at the counter and they can barely comprehend what you're saying. You're placing an order. I don't, I don't know. Stop me if I'm lying. Uh, please don't, don't, don't therapist me together. Don't, don't, don't therapist me, you know, for, you know, th that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> I'm not talking about somebody with dyslexia. I'm talking about someone who has managed to be pushed through the school system to graduate and becomes a liability to our society. Something as simple as taking your order at a restaurant, they can't comprehend the basics. That's not, I'm not talking about somebody who has a legitimate issue, a legitimate learning disability. That's not what I'm talking about. Please take your therapist skills. And, you know, go practice that on somebody else. That's not what I'm talking about. Don't misconstrue. Don't intentionally misunderstand what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about someone who has been pushed through the school system, never took responsibility for their educational path. I'm talking about someone who was pushed through the school system and never saw it as an res individual responsibility on themselves to take their educational journey, their academic journey, as a personal responsibility on themselves. That's what I'm talking about. The same thing for a Muslim who can, a person who can be Muslim for 10 years and still the same person that they were 10 years ago. They never took their personal, they never took their spiritual journey as a personal responsibility. They never took their spiritual journey as a personal responsibility on themselves. They flow through the system and then here we are 10 years into the religion 
15 years into the religion and you still the same individual that you were before you converted to Islam. And I'm trying to say, how in the world is that even possible? Other than the fact that you sincerely neglected, sincerely neglected, intentionally neglected basic principles of the religion. Because had you followed the religion the way that you were supposed to, you would have begun to make changes almost immediately after you converted to Islam. Immediately, show me one Sahabi, one companion of the Prophet Sallallahu who from the day they converted to Islam did not begin to make changes to themselves. Never found any of the Sahaba five years into Islam and they were the same person. They had the same friends from Jahiliyyah. Never. They immediately disassociated themselves from their non-Muslim friends, some even from their non-Muslim relatives. Everything about Kufr, everything about Jahiliyyah, everything about the culture and the society that they came from, they disassociated themselves from it and completely embraced Islam as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu tkhulu fi silmi kaffah. وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ O you who believe, enter into Islam wholeheartedly and don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. Come into the religion all the way. All the way. Is there a hadith that speaks about how fast the believer will cross the sirat based upon how fast he or she has changed their behavior? Not changed their behavior, but how fast they are in obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will go across, that's actually a statement of Ibn Qayyim, not a hadith. Ibn Qayyim said the person will go across the bridge over the hellfire on Yom Al-Qiyamah based upon how quick he or she was to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you are slow in obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then come at to dinu to dan, then just as you deal, so shall you be dealt with, then you will be slow going across the bridge over the hellfire. Al-jaza'u min jins al-amal. This is a principle in our religion that the reward is commensurate with the action. You know, so your, your reward is connected with the action or your recompense or your compensation. So if you want to go across the bridge with lightning speed, then you have to be just that fast when it comes to obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You have to obey Allah and his messenger with that same level of dedication and speed that you would like to go across the bridge over the hellfire. Great point. But the point I'm making is that when you look at the Sahaba, عنهم, when they converted to Islam, they automatically knew that this was the standard and this is the standard and there was no going beneath that. Whereas today we convert to Islam and we make our own standards. We make our own standards. And then we'll use a million and one justifications to just simply remain who we are. Just simply say you want to be who you want to be and still call yourself Muslim. And I'm here to tell you that that is unacceptable. I'm saying that that is unacceptable. I'm sorry, I cannot acquiesce. I cannot give in to the current condition that you see the current state that we are in as a Muslim community. I cannot, I refuse. I refuse to accept that as our norm. I refuse. I refuse to accept where we are right now in our communities as this is, the, as this is our norm. That's not our norm. Islam is great. The Sahaba were great men and women. Take a look through some of the biographies of some of these great men and women. Wallah and you'll see what I'm talking about. Wallah al-Azim, brothers and sisters, what I want you to do, I want you to start reading the biographies of the Sahaba and the Sahabi Act. One of the things that helped me tremendously it's almost like me and some of the Sahaba and the Sahabiyat are on a first name basis. I've read their biographies and studied their lives to such a degree that it's almost like I know them personally. 
almost like I know them personally. Give you stories about this one and stories about that, how this one converted to Islam and how that one converted to Islam and what this one's path was and how this one did this and did that. And one of the things that you will find that will help you to understand what I'm talking about now and from the perspective that I'm saying it is reading the bar, familiarizing yourself with the biographies of many of these great men and women. The moment you immerse yourself in these stories, you'll begin to see the greatness of Islam and you will begin to look at us and what we are doing here. And almost as if like, what in the, what is this? What is, what, what are we doing? What is, what version of Islam is this? They asked, um, Imam Bukhari, you know, uh, excuse me, asked Abdullah bin Mubarak. Abdullah bin Mubarak. And um, they said, you know, after Salatul Isha, why don't you sit with us and talk? You know, you kind of disappear. We don't see you anywhere after Salatul Isha. Why don't you sit with us and talk? You think you're better than us? And Abdullah bin Mubarak, he said, I don't sit with you after Salatul Isha because I live with the Sahaba in the Aishu. Ma sahaba, I go live with the sahaba, meaning I go after Salatul Isha and read their biographies, immerse myself in their stories, immerse myself in their stories. Right? You can you can actually start with the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There should be no area of the Prophet Sallallahu life that you as a Muslim are not familiar with. If this is the man that we say we follow, this is the man who's part of our Shahada is connected to him, how in the world could you be ignorant of him? How? This is a man that you send salams upon in every single salat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. Every single salat. There should not be an aspect of his life if you've been Muslim five years, there should not be an aspect of his life that you are not familiar with. From beginning to end. From beginning to end. But if I were to start asking you guys some questions about the life of the Prophet Wasallam, you would show your ignorance. <laughs> if I start asking you some basic questions about the life of the Prophet Wasallam, you would be embarrassed. And you have to ask yourself, how is it that you, in your prayer, part of your prayer is that you're sending salams and greeting of peace upon this man every single prayer. Your, in your, your shahada, the second half of your shahada is connected to this man. You will not get into, into Jannah in many instances without the intercession of this man. Yet you know nothing about him. Not much. But if I were to ask you about this singer, this rapper, the stats on this tennis player, the stats on this basketball player, stats on this soccer player, you could give me the entire rundown. But I ask you, I ask you something basic. For example, I ask you, how many children did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have? And how many, how many names of his children do you know? Who was his oldest child? Who was his youngest child? How many sons did he have? What was the kunya of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? These are just basic questions. Basic questions that every Muslim should know about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So much of the disdain and the disregard that many Muslims have today for the Quran and the Sunnah is due to our disconnect, our disconnection from Islam. Our disconnection from Islam. Some, some basic questions about the religion would, would show our disconnect from the religion. People hate what they don't understand. And so you have to think about the disdain and the disregard that many Muslims have for the religion. And all of it is due to our ignorance. Much of it is due to our ignorance. Much, much of it. 
It's due to our ignorance. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, the, this hadith, man, it just blows my mind every time I read this hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, Yushiku rajulun shab'an, shab'an muttaki'un ala arikatihi yaqulu baynana wa baynakum kitabullah. He said, perhaps there's going to come a time. Perhaps, this is the Prophet ﷺ thinking years ahead. Knowing that after his death, Islam would begin to dwindle. The practice of Islam, here again, would go back to being strange. As we talked last week about the strangeness of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said, Yushiku rajulun shab'an. That perhaps there's going to come a time. Perhaps there's going to come a time where a man will be full. A man will be full. Talking about his stomach full. Protruding from being so full. Muttaki'un ala arikatihi, reclining, relaxing on his couch. What he's talking about, as the scholars say, what he's talking about, this description, it points to their laziness and lack of regard for the religion. Laziness. Perhaps there's going to come a time where a man will be full reclining on his couch and he will say the only law that we regard is the Quran whatever is in the Quran that is halal we will consider halal and whatever is in the 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 Quran that is haram we will consider it haram here is a man full because that's not the description of a believer a believer is never described as full why? I want you guys to answer me that question. A believer is never described as somebody who is full, shab'an. Why? Why is that not a description of the believer? Let me see who can catch it. Exactly. Exactly. Because we only eat filling up one third. Very good, mashallah. I can't see your name, but you got it. The believer is never described as full because the Prophet Sallallahu said the what? The believer eats only filling up one third for food, one third for water, and the other third for breathing. The believer is never described as full. That's not how we eat. Who eats like that? Who did the Prophet ﷺ say eat like that? Who eats like that? The disbelievers. They eat until they are full. So let's unpack this hadith for a moment. He said perhaps there's going to come a time where a man will be full. Shab'an. Stomach stuffed. Reclining on his couch, which is another quality that is not a quality of a believer because the believer does not eat laying down. The believer doesn't eat standing up. The sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, right, is to sit down and eat. So a person that is gluttonous, that is the disbeliever. That shows you that this person whose stomach is full, reclining on his couch, this is not even the description of a believer, even though this person is Muslim. Talking about the bird, the distance from Islam during that time. These are the people that will be commenting about Islam. These are the people that will be talking about Islam. These are the people that will be, you know, spewing their opinions and their suggestions about Islam. While your description is a description of a disbeliever, not the description of a believer. And are we, are we not here today? Is that not the description of many Muslims today? Many Muslims, you eat with your left hand. You don't even care or even to be concerned with the fact that the sunnah is to eat with your right hand. You eat with your left hand. Some Muslims even eat pork. You still eat pork. You drink. You eat until you're stuffed, until you're full. You go home. You lay down. You don't pray. And then yet you jump on social media 
and you have the audacity to comment based upon your opinions and your views and how you feel when it comes to Islam. You have got to be kidding me. He's speaking about our time right now. Right now. Subhanallah. Almost as if he's living amongst us in this very moment. Perhaps there's going to come a time where a man, Muslim, will have his stomach full, reclining on a couch, commenting about the Qur'an, saying whatever we find in the Qur'an, halal, we'll consider halal. Whatever we find in the Qur'an, haram, we'll consider haram. Which is in fact a lie. Which is in fact a lie. Because if everything you found in the Qur'an, halal, you would consider it halal, and everything you found in the Qur'an haram, you would consider it haram, then you would have found in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يُطِعِ الرَّسُولِ فَقَدْ أَطَعَ الله. Whoever obeys the messenger has indeed obeyed Allah. What they're doing, what they're attempting to do by commenting on the Qur'an is to dismiss the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To dismiss the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But their disregard for Islam is as a result of their distance from Islam. The qualities that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned of this individual is not even the qualities of a believer. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the believer eats filling his lower intestines one third for food, one third for water, one third for breathing. The believer is never described as full, shab'an. Because the believer doesn't eat until he's full. That's not how we eat. That's not the etiquettes of eating of a believer. The believer fills one third and he removes his hand from the table. I'm not full, but I fulfilled my one third. <laughs> I filled up my one third. You understand the description the Prophet Sallallahu gave of the individual is not even the description of someone who is described as a believer. Full, reclining on your couch, and then on top of that, commenting about the book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala without knowledge. All of this description right here is what we are seeing with many Muslims today. Commenting on social media about things they have absolutely no knowledge of. When much of your lifestyle is in total contradiction to Islam, yet you have the audacity to get on social media and comment about something in the religion. I'm always amazed. I look at the people that I have blocked within the past, like maybe two weeks. People, oh, you said this and you said that. And then I, I go back to their page. I always go back and look at the person's page because I want to see, you know, what, what do you know that I don't know? So they'll put something on my page, something as early as right after Jumu'ah. I go to my Facebook page. Oh, Shadi Muhammad is a deviant. Uh, scholars warned against him. And then you go back to that person's page. God forbid it's a woman. Allah Musta'an. Women, Wallah Allah Sisters, you need to just stop. <laughs> Brothers can do a better job at masking their haram. But the sisters, it's like soon as you go to her page, it's like, A'udhu Billah, Astaghfirullah. And you had the audacity to comment. It's like, oh my God, you got to stop. I, I can't take you serious. How do you comment on Islam? And then some, we go to your page and nothing but haram all over you. I can't even look at your page. That's how haram your page is. I take one scroll up. Astaghfirullah. I, I just get off your page. But you have the audacity to come on social media and comment on something regarding Islamic knowledge that you have no understanding of. The audacity. I'm perturbed. <laughs> it is disturbing to see Muslims comment on matters regarding the religion. And you are not even a religious person to begin with. You have no regard for Islam. You shouldn't even be commenting on anything regarding the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so I guess my next question, is, the next question you're going to ask me is, so a person has to be religious to have an opinion? I want you to answer that question. 
Because that question is actually oxymoronic. Does a person have to be religious to have an opinion? I want you to answer that question. Because the question is actually oxymoronic. It's an oxymoron to even ask a question like that. So what you're saying is the person has to be religious in order to have an opinion. MashaAllah. Any ayat that you find in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is challenging the disbelievers to challenging the disbelievers to bring some type of proof, he's always asking them to do so with knowledge. <laughs> bring your proof if what you're saying is true. Nabbi'uni <laughs> bi'ilmin. Inform me with knowledge. Ask the people of knowledge when you don't know. Every ayah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about, you know, an exchange of views and opinions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always requests that it be done so with knowledge. And you can't have knowledge of the religion unless you're actually religious. Because you got to look through the text to find the information. That doesn't necessarily make you religious, but it gives you some type of connection to the religion opposed to someone who doesn't read the Quran at all and doesn't read the Sunnah at all and actually would be misguided by the information if they looked into it. <laughs> There's some people who look into the Quran and they get misguided from looking into it because they're not looking into the Quran with the lens that is required. So yeah, you do have to be religious to have an opinion. You do have to have some type of connection to Islam in order for you to be, you know, to be in a position to speak about the religion. If you don't have any connection to the deen, how in the world are you do you feel justified having an opinion? Right, it would be hypocrisy. How do you feel justified having an opinion about anything in the religion when you're not connected to the religion at all? And I mean, you know, people are going to do whatever they want to do. I'm just saying that when I speak or when I say something or when I put something out there, like, don't get mad at me. <laughs> don't get mad at me. Part of the problem that I run into with the Muslim community is that I call the Muslim community out on their stuff and they just don't want to be called out. They don't want to be told about themselves. And so you've attacked my honor. You know, he's ignorant. He's a deviant. He's a stray. The scholars have warned against him. That's why the scholars have warned against him to the end of it. Like you'll tarnish my like my if my honor was left to the mercy of the Muslim community, I would have no honor. You guys have all but destroyed my honor. My honor comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala though. So it, it doesn't bother me. It is what it is. I, I know exactly what it is. They call the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam majnoon. They call him crazy. They accuse his wife of adultery. They, they came at him from so many different angles. Hypocrites in the community. The disbelievers. You know what I mean? So, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defended him, you know, multiple, multiple times. I, I don't have anybody to defend me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will defend me as well because many of the people who comment on me and comment on what I'm doing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes them as well. It's like a patient trying to tell the doctor how to be a doctor. I love it. I love it. Great analogy. MashaAllah. Great analogy. <laughs> it's like the patient trying to tell the doctor how to be a doctor. MashaAllah. So much of the disdain and the disregard that we have of Islam today is due to our disassociation and our disconnection from Islam. 
The Prophet Sallallahu at the end of the hadith, he said, don't do this. He said, because I have been given the Qur'an and that which is like it. إِنَّمَا أُتِيتُ الْقُرْآنِ وَمِثْلَهُ مَعْهُ And so the basis of my khutbah today was the holding on to the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And if we would simply stick to what the Prophet Sallallahu left us upon, uh, upon, we could avoid much of the fitan, the trials, the tribulations, the controversy, the confusion that we see going on in the Muslim community. But we have abandoned, excuse me, we have abandoned what the Prophet Sallallahu left us upon. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ بَعْدِ فَسَيَّرَ اخْتِلَافٍ كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالسُنَّةِ he said, those of you who live long after me will see much controversy and confusion. You'll see much controversy and confusion. So hold fast to my sunnah. Alaykum bis sunnati. Hold fast to my sunnah. And the sunnah of the rightly guided Khalifa is after me. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. Abdu alayha bin nawajidah. Bite onto it with your molded teeth. SubhanAllah. And so we are living in a time of great controversy and confusion. Every time one fitna disappears, another one comes that is greater than the one that disappeared. And it will continue like that until we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The dunya does not get any better, brothers and sisters. There will be times when, you know, we will have a breather. We will have times. But overall, the time that comes after will usually be worse than the time that came before it. That doesn't mean that we won't have some windows of or periods of time wherein there is some a breather. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. In the ba'd al-usri yusra. After difficulty, there will come some ease. However, for the most part, there, is, there does not come a time upon us except the time that comes after it will be worse than it. As the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned in the hadith, لا يأتي عليكم زمان إلا والذي بعده شر منه حتى تلقى الله حتى تلقى تلقى ربكم the Prophet ﷺ said, there is no time that comes upon a people except that the time that comes after it will be worse than it until you meet your Lord. Meaning this is a continuous process. A continuous process until we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, there will never be a year that will be better than another year or a leader that will be better than another leader. Your scholars will disappear. Your righteous folk will disappear. And there will exist a group of people who will judge affairs based upon their opinions. Islam, And they will destroy Islam. Scholars will disappear. Righteous folk will disappear. And there will be people who will be left to judge affairs based upon their own opinions because they don't have any knowledge. And in doing so, they will chip away at the pristineness of Islam. The pureness of Islam. They will continue to chip away at it until the pureness of Islam is gone. They will destroy Islam. And I keep saying this to you, brothers and sisters. If we do not correct what we see going on in the masajid, in the Muslim community, this behavior continues until we don't even know what the sunnah is anymore. We don't even know what this is. Wallah Allah, mark my words. There's going to come a time when you are going to enter into it. That, that time has already happened for me. <laughs> I'm already there. There's going to come a time when you're going to walk into a masjid and you're not going to recognize anything from Islam. From the etiquettes of the Muslims, even in the masjid, you're not going to recognize anything from Islam. And you're going to be sitting there like, Oh my God, this is that time. We're there. We're there. You're going to walk into the masjid. And this is more so in the African-American Muslim community than in any other community. More so in the African-American Muslim community than any other community. And ask, ask yourself why. Why do we see things taking place in the African-American Muslim community 
that you don't see taking place necessarily in any of the other foreign messages. Why? Ask yourself. Because I see things going on in the African-American Muslim community that I don't see going on in any other masajid. <laughs> Stuff that is just specific to us. And that's, that's within itself is, is just so frustrating. Ignorance, yes, absolutely. Is because we carry our jahiliya, we carry our pre-Islamic ignorance with us everywhere we go we don't know how to tame it <laughs> right islam is supposed to take you out of the hood mentally even though you still live in the hood you understand you can still live in the hood there were many muslims who stayed in mecca never migrated from mecca to medina stayed in mecca but did they adopt the Meccan, you know, culture and, and mannerisms of the people in Mecca? La wallahi. They immediately come adopted Islam, even though they still lived in Mecca. You can, Islam is supposed to bring you out of the hood mentality, spiritually, your soul, your spirit, your physical body. You still live in the hood, but you are not of the hood. You're within and without. We don't know how to make that distinction. They bring the hood into the masjid. They bring the hood into the masjid, evidenced by the incident that happened today in the masjid. We stream in live, so many of you saw the interaction, saw the engagement. It's just like, what in the heck? Are, what are we? What am I doing? For me, I'm saying to myself, man. I need to stop going to places like that because that's going to end up becoming my the, the the my demise. One of these ignorant people are going to kill you. This is what I'm telling myself. One of these people, be due to their ignorance, they're going to kill you. That's a fact. We bring our jahiliya with us. We wear it on our shoulders like a cloak of honor. We wear our jahiliya like it's honor. Meanwhile, it is the epitome of dishonor. If you only knew, it is the epitome of dishonor. Nobody respects the stuff that we bring with us from the hood Except us. Any other place in the world that you go, you're looked at in disdain. But we are the only people who celebrate it. We are the only people who worship it. We are the only people who take pride in it. Meanwhile, it's, it's despicable. In any other circle you go to, it's despicable. And it's embarrassing. Meanwhile, with us... This is just who we are. That's not who we are. That's not who we are. That's not who we are. And it, it's sad, man. It really is. It really is. But we celebrate this stuff. We celebrate it in music. We're black African Americans. We are the only, with hip hop and rap. We are the only genre of music that celebrates murdering your own folks, your own people. Give me another genre, another genre of music that celebrates the murder and the killing of their own people. There is nothing more insane than that. There is nothing more insane than that. We literally celebrate a genre of music that we take pride in. 50 years of hip hop. We take pride in it. And look at how many lives have been lost as a result of that. Look at how many lives have been lost as a result of that.
and we celebrate it. We celebrate murdering and killing our own folks. Subhanallah, man. It's insane, man. Insanity. I'm going to go pray Muqdim, inshallah. I'll leave the live running. I'll uh, be back in about seven to ten minutes, inshallah. Ta I'm going to go pray Muqdim, and I'll be back. There's another portion of this that I want to kind of hone in on, uh, and I want you guys to, to take, you know, take notes of, inshallah. Ta
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيكم يحب ربنا ويرضى وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا so الحمد لله and continuing with our discussion about our disconnect many of us our disconnect from Islam and how that is showing up in the way that we interact with one another how that shows up in the way that we manage sacred spaces. Let me, let me, let me share something with you guys. The masjid is, should be a sacred space. The masjid should be a place where a person can go and feel safe. Never have to worry about someone putting their hands on you. Like in the African-American Muslim community, we have seen fights in the masjid. We've seen people get shot in the masjid. I know of a brother who was pistol whipped inside the masjid. I have broken up fights in front of masjids. I have stopped a brother from shooting a brother in front of the masjid. These are all experiences that I've interacted with personally. So within the African-American Muslim community, for, for the most part, not all African-American Muslim, you know, uh, Masajid, but for the most part, especially the ones in the, in the city, some of the most unsafe places that you can go. We have imams that have been murdered in the parking lot of a masjid. People's Items have been, you know, we just had in, in Wilmington, we had to put a person out of the masjid because they were stealing during Ramadan. During Ramadan. Wallahu alam whether the person was Muslim or not. But here again, we don't, we don't take stock of the people who are coming into the masjid. So, you know, people can just say, I'm Muslim, come in, you know, to the masjid and steal items out of the masjid. And, you know, <laughs> subhanAllah, during Ramadan, during Ramadan. And we have to ask ourselves at some point, when does the masjid become a sacred space? Why are we fighting with people who call themselves Muslims to maintain a space that should be sacred? And that should be, you know, people should feel safe. And we're fighting, you know, against this culture of violence, this culture, you know, this culture of violence, this culture of dysfunction that we are bringing with us into these sacred spaces, fighting with them to try to maintain some level of harmony, some level of peace, some level of security in the massaging. You have Sister Claire Muhammad School, Philadelphia Masjid, where they have metal detectors. You have to be scanned to make sure you don't have a weapon on you when you come in the masjid. You have to be scanned. You have a poster, a, 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 a notice on the, on the front masjid, in the masjid in Wilmington. There is no guns, there's no weapons allowed in the masjid. We have to tell people, don't bring weapons into the masjid. The, my purpose for calling the brother out today during the Jumu'ah was because my fear was that he had a weapon on him. That, that was my fear. I saw him, you know, tugging with, you know, underneath his hoodie. And I'm just like, man, does this guy got, he have a weapon on him? I have to stop the Jumu'ah and address that. Turn my attention towards that because in that moment, my concern became the safety of everybody. The safety of everybody in the masjid. I know those of you who are watching were like, oh my God, are we about to watch this happen in, on live? On live, like live YouTube, Facebook and Instagram. We're about to see something happen inside a masjid on Jumu'ah while it's streaming live. Do you understand? That became my fear. 
I had to stop the Jumwa and address that immediately because my fear was I didn't I, I, that everybody in that room became my responsibility in that moment. Everybody in that room became my responsibility in that moment. And I can't, I can't, uh, not on my watch, I cannot allow, I don't have the luxury, as I keep telling you guys, I don't have the luxury to be oblivious. You don't have the luxury to be oblivious. You can't just ignore what is staring you right in your face. I'm sorry. Because the behavior has become so normalized. The behavior has become so normalized. I don't care if he was sick or had some. I, I, I'm sorry. I don't have the luxury to sift through whether there's some mental illness. That I don't have the luck. We can worry about that later. <laughs> we can worry about that later. One of the brothers said to me, when he sat down next to me, I was going to get up and go to the other side of the message. Brother said, I was going to get up and go to the other side of the message. But my question is, how has that become normal? Here again, allowing these young brothers to show up at the masjid any way that they want. Smelling like weed, wearing masks, you know, wearing, you know, skinny jeans with rips in them and your, your crack of your behind showing. We just allow people to show up at the masjid any way that they want to. Well, Allah, Allah Deen, there, it, you, you guys, you're going to fight me for it, but it is what it is. There needs to be a dress code at the masjid. There needs to be a dress code. You can't come in here with a push iced on. You can't come in here with a mask on. Can't come in here with a weapon. You can't come in here smelling like weed. If we do not implement these things, if we do not implement these things, you are going to see our massage turn into no different than what you see happening on any street. Any street. The masjid will be no different. The masjid is now becoming an extension of the dysfunction that we experience in the hood. That's a fact. The masjid has become an extension, extension of the dysfunction that we are experiencing in the hood. The, the dysfunction that we are experiencing in our homes, the dysfunction that we are experiencing in our neighborhoods has now trickled over into the masjid. I keep saying this, it's falling on deaf ears. The masajid has become an extension of the dysfunction that we experience in our homes and the dysfunction that we are experiencing in our neighborhoods. And it trickles right over into the masjid. The dysfunction that we experience in the prison system. The dysfunction that we experience in the school system, all of that is now coming back to the masjid. And it almost reminds me of the statement of Malcolm. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon him. What did Malcolm say? This is the chickens coming home to roost. The chickens are coming home to roost. Because the reason why all of this dysfunction is coming back to the masjid is because the masjid never addressed the problems to begin with. The masjid has never addressed the problems to begin with. Chickens coming home to roost. So all of the dysfunction from the prison system, from the home, from the school, from the neighborhood is now coming back to the masjid. 
and even in the masjid, still not addressing the dysfunction. We still get on the mimbars. Our imams get on the mimbars every Friday. We're going to talk about the shurut of salah. We're going to talk about this and some random topics instead of honing in on the issues and addressing them head on. You cannot play with the dysfunction. You have to meet dysfunction with the same energy that it comes with. Otherwise, it will overpower you. You cannot. Dysfunction is like a bully. It looks for the weakest link and it just overpowers you. And if you don't address it and you don't meet it head on, it's only a matter of time before that same dysfunction that you ignored, that same dysfunction that you disregarded, that same dysfunction that you turned a blind eye to will turn around and bite you in the behind. That's a fact. All of the family dysfunction that many of us experience is because we never talk about it. We never talk about it. So, so because everybody is tight lipped about the elephant in the room in our families, the dysfunction trickles over from one generation to the next. Now, the grandchildren are experiencing the dysfunction that started with the grandparents. But the grandparents never addressed it. They never did. They never dealt with it. So it trickles over from the next generation to the next generation because everybody ignores it. Everybody ignores it. So it consumes everybody that comes in contact with it. That's the nature of dysfunction. Yes, we have always swept family or community dysfunction underneath the rug. We do it in the Muslim community as well. We do it in the Muslim community as well. We sweep the dysfunction right under the prayer rug and move right along as if nothing happened. Dare somebody to come and lift that prayer rug up and expose what is going on underneath there. And he or she becomes public enemy number one. And it's only a matter of time before these same young guys who have taken over street corners have, you know, their dysfunction has consumed everything in the hood is now going to consume the masjid. Is now going to consume the masjid. And when that happens, you guys can have it. I'm out. I'm gone because <laughs> I've warned you. I've warned you. There comes a time when I have to prioritize my safety and the safety of my family. And when the safety of my family becomes the priority, you can forget about I'm not coming to your message doing no chutbahs, no lectures, no nothing. Nothing. When my family's safety become the priority, I'm not, I'm, I'm out. I'm good. Y'all can have it. Y'all can have it. I'll pray for you. I'll make dua for you. But I will never put my family, myself, or my family at risk to come give a chutbah or come give a lecture. It's not that serious. Not that serious. I stay my behind right where I am. It's not that serious. This is an awakening, brothers and sisters. This is an awakening. I don't know, but I've seen too much. In the years that I have been Muslim, I have seen too much, man. Seen too much, man. To not say something about it. This, this condition has existed in our communities for so long. And it's like we still keep welcoming in the dysfunction instead of putting measures in place to ensure that you've consumed the school. The dysfunction has consumed the school. The dysfunction has consumed the prison system. The dysfunction has consumed many of the homes. The dysfunction has consumed the hood. But your dysfunction will not consume the masjid. It will not consume the masjid. 
and is banging on the doors of the masjid. The dysfunction is banging on the doors. The masjid is the last place that our dysfunction has not consumed. The masjid is the last place that our dysfunction has not consumed. And we've seen a shooting at the Eid. We've seen shootings in front of the masjid, the masajid. It's banging on the front door of the masjid. You guys don't see that? The, our dysfunction is knocking at the door of the masjid. And it's only a matter of time before that dysfunction is now in the masjid. And we're seeing remnants of it now. What we address today, what I address today is just a small snippet. Small snippet of how this dysfunction is now consuming us, including our massage. We are toxic people. I mean, everybody has their toxic traits with them, but our toxicity knows no bounds. There are no boundaries to our toxicity, our toxicity, none. Some people, their toxicity, their dysfunction is only in their home. When they step outside of their home, you would never know until you marry into that family and then you see all of the dysfunction behind the scenes. But you would never know that because their dysfunction has a, you know, has a limit. Some people's dysfunction is only in certain areas. Our dysfunction consumes every single aspect and facet of our lives. Our marriage, our children, our schools, our neighborhoods, and even our massage. And as we're riding home today, my son going on 16, he's in the car and he was like, Abby, it seemed like, like you like really hard on, you know, our people. You really hard on African-Americans. And I said, make no mistake about it. I love my people. That's the only reason why I'm still in the ring, still fighting. After, given everything that I've been through with the African-American Muslim community, I'm still fighting. That's love. I said, but I reserve the right to be critical of African-American Muslims. I reserve the right to be critical because my criticism is out of love, not disdain. It's out of love, not out of disdain. The same thing that James Baldwin said, you know, like I reserve the right to be critical of America as an American. I reserve the right to be critical of America. As an African-American, I reserve the right to be critical of African-American Muslims. Whether you're born and raised Muslim or you converted to Islam, I reserve the right to be critical. And the criticism is out of love. Look beyond, you know, the outward presentation and see the love that is behind it. That is a love for us to do better, to be better. The love, someone that is critical, that understands our potential. That understands our potential. But also understands the, the, the depths of our dysfunction as well. And the only way that we are going to, you know, sustain ourselves and maintain some level of, you know, prominence or greatness in our communities is that we have to return back to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is the only way out of this. Return back to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is the only way out of this. There is no other way out of this. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, nas thumma ladina yalunuhum, thumma ladina yalunuhum. The best nation, the best of nations is my nation. The best of communities is my community. The people that were around when I was around. And then those that came after them and then those 
that came after them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran in Surah Al Baqarah, uh, Surah Al Imran, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu taqullaha haqqa tuqatihi. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu taqullaha wa atasimu bi habli lahi jami'an wa la tafarraku. And hold on to the rope of Allah, all of you together, and do not, be, do not become divided. Our dysfunction has always led to our downfall in life, financial, prosperity, business, and much more. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not that, no, it's not the dysfunction. It's lack of addressing the dysfunction. The, every culture has their dysfunction. Every culture. But it's addressing the dysfunction in a way that is anecdotal. In a way that is anecdotal. Like you're providing the remedy. You're providing the antidote. But not addressing. And this has been. This has been my struggle with the Salafi community for so many years. They address Tawheed. They talk about Tawheed. They talk about Minhaj. They talk about all of these other sometimes less important matters of the religion. For years, they were talking about Jarh wa Ta'adil, this subject of the science of hadith that only a select few people understand it. Only a few people understand it. Only a few people have ever even studied it. Many of the people who were talking about the science of Jarrah Ta'adil themselves never even studied the subject. But they're busying the people, common folk, lay people, busying them with these matters of the religion and never address the dysfunction. Never address. As a matter of fact, some of them are so delusional into thinking that all you have to do is understand Tawheed and all of your cultural dysfunctions will just completely disappear. MashaAllah tabarakallah. All of your cultural dysfunctions will disappear. MashaAllah tabarakallah. So the years of dysfunction, familial dysfunction, uh, educational dysfunction, financial and economic dysfunction are just going to completely disappear the moment you understand the concept of Tawheed. It's just... I, I, man, subhanAllah, man, I'm, I'm at a loss for words, man. I'm at a loss for words. And these are the people who are your leaders in the Muslim community. More so in the inner city. It almost feels like this is contrived. It almost feels like this was contrived. It almost feels like this stuff was planted purposely in our environments, in our masajid. To keep us dysfunctional. Stop me when I'm wrong. It almost feels like this was in purposefully done to keep us dysfunctional. Because there's no way that we've had students of knowledge who have gone overseas, studied Islam, come back, graduated, come back since the, the mid-1990s all the way up until probably around 2015. And we're still getting worse. We're not getting better. We're getting worse. It, it's like it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It's it, it um, like I'm where I'm sitting there sometimes where I just kind of shake my head and I'm like, man, is is there a higher up somewhere? That is ensuring that this these people stay in these positions and continuously push out this information into the Muslim community, the African American Muslim community, to keep us dysfunctional. 
to keep us dysfunctional. You got to start thinking like, how is this even possible? How did all of these brothers graduate, come back, and every single one of them that is African-American is somehow astray? And unfit to give tawa, unfit to come back to their communities and raise the standards of their communities. I, I, it just doesn't make sense. Every Arab, every Pakistani from America that has gone overseas and study, graduate with their degree, they come back, they integrate right back into their communities. They become their assumed positions of leadership, imams, you know, youth leaders or whatever the case may be. And they continue the wheel of their society, of their communities. They continue, they continue the progress. Us, on the other hand... Any African-American student who has graduated has to come back and has to go through this rigorous process of kissing up to this ignoramus, kissing up to this person, kissing up to that person, being stamped, getting the stamp of approval from this scholar, from this group of scholars. And if in fact he's not, then he's tossed to the side. He's labeled as a deviant, labeled as a stray, can't take from him. And that's it's only done with African-American students of knowledge. You have to ask yourself, what is wrong with this picture? For years, this has boggled me. For years, I have been tossing around this idea like, what the heck is wrong with us? Why does this only happen to us? Every foreign imam, every foreign student of knowledge, Pakistani, Arab, or any other culture graduates from the university, integrates back into their community, assumes a role or whatever that role is, but continues the progress of those communities. We, on the other hand, we graduate and you got to go through, you know, we got to filter you out. Subhanallah, every single African-American student of knowledge is somehow astray and you shouldn't take from him. Do you think that that is a coincidence? Do you think that that is a coincidence? That's not a coincidence. That is by design. And here we are in 2024, still dealing with the same dysfunction that we have been dealing with from the time that I have been given dawah all the way back to 2002, 2003. And we're still dealing with the same dysfunction. Even worse now than it was yesterday. Even worse today than it was yesterday. Yeah. There's a bigger play here. And you guys need to keep your eyes open and start paying attention to what is going on. There is a bigger play here. For years, I have been telling these brothers, you're teaching Tawheed, but the way you're teaching it, you're not infusing the concept of Tawheed in a way where it is addressing our cultural dysfunction, provided maybe they didn't have the knowledge to do so. But you fought, they fought anybody who tried to introduce them to a higher understanding of what they were doing. They fought you tooth and nail. They would much rather label you as off it and astray because you were trying to introduce them to something that was far above their pay grade rather than welcome that and say, OK, maybe that's another angle that I wasn't looking at. Or maybe that's an angle that I am not prepared to tackle, but you do it since you seem like you're very good at that. They understand. I used to teach at Germantown Masjid. I used to give lectures on a regular basis at Germantown Masjid. Yeah, maybe you didn't know that. Maybe you just converted to Islam yesterday and didn't know that. Before any of those brothers, with the exception of probably Abu Hassan Malik, he's probably the oldest of, of them that were probably around at that time, before I was. I used to give regular classes at Germantown Masjid. And then, of course, when ego gets in, ego comes into play 
And then people start to feel like you think that you know more than they. This is that 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 ego and the fix mentality. You don't want to welcome anything new. You don't want, you know, I'm teaching matters on marriage, families, because I'm converting to Islam. I come from a broken family. So there's nobody who can identify brokenness like someone who has grown up in broken and dysfunction. I grew up in a dysfunctional family. I grew up in a broken home. So if there's anyone who can identify that very quickly is a person that comes from that. And when I converted to Islam and I gained enough information about the religion where I could kind of like clean my lens off a little bit, I saw it. I saw it. I'm like, oh my God, look at the dysfunction in these families. And so I started to take what I was learning about the religion and kind of infusing it into addressing some of the cultural and familial dysfunction that I saw. And for many of those brothers, they couldn't handle it. Either because they didn't think of it first or they didn't have the wherewithal to address it themselves or simply because of jealousy. Because they're looking at it from the perspective of you're going to get more notoriety, more popularity than I am. And as a result of that, they turn on you. They turn on you simply because you're doing something or addressing something that they don't have the knowledge or the wherewithal to address. In a nutshell, that's exactly what happened. And you're trying to say like, OK, well, why haven't you? Why are you guys not addressing the dysfunction in the community? Why are you not addressing like I'm, I'm going all the back all the way back to 2003? Why are you not addressing the familial dysfunction, the family dysfunction? No lectures, no discussions, no uh, conferences, no nothing dealing with the familial dysfunction. And even if we still don't know how to address it in a way where it's anecdotal. They still don't know how to address it in a way where you're providing remedies and solutions to it. It's not solution oriented. As a matter of fact, it helps to exacerbate the problem because the brothers, they found out how to take the information and manipulate it in a way where it works for them. And it just adds to the dysfunction. And so here we are, 2024, and the dysfunction is literally knocking on the door of the masjid because we haven't addressed it. We haven't addressed it. Meanwhile, we have all the tools that we need to address the dysfunction, but we choose not to. We choose to ignore it. Still focusing on Tawheed, still focusing on, you know, the three aspects of Tawheed, still focusing on, you know, Still not even taking those concepts and infusing them into your teachings in a way where it becomes anecdotal. Round and round we go. We go around and around and around and around. Let's say we just recycle the dysfunction. And we're going to continue to recycle the dysfunction until it consumes even our massaging. And once that happens, we are done. <laughs> we are done. We are done. The moment the dysfunction begins to consume our massaging, we are done. Man, subhanAllah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his tawfiq. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to rectify our situations. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our shortcomings, to forgive us for our lack of concern for the matters that, that actually matter. Isn't dealing with social issues part of our tawheed? It is. 
But when you're dealing with people who haven't formally studied Islam, many of these brothers did not formally study Islam. And that's not to say that somebody who formally studied Islam knows how to make that connection either. But a person who has formally studied Islam has been taken through a rigorous academic process. They've been introduced to books. They've been, you know, they had to write research papers. None of those brothers who've been to Yemen and Egypt or whatever the case may be, none of them had to write any academic papers or essays or dissertations. They didn't have to write any academic dissertations related to Islam. They sat at the feet of Sheikh Mukbil, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, sat at the feet of Sheikh Yahya Al-Hujuri, sat at the, at the feet of Sheikh Fulan in, in Egypt or Sheikh so-and-so in Egypt and all these random places that these brothers went for six months here, a year here. Ask any of those brothers. They never sat anywhere for a substantial amount of time. Most of them, 99.9% .9 of them did not sit anywhere for any substantial amount of time. They never wrote any dissertations, never did any research, never did any extensive research. So you going through a, a, a rigorous academic program like the Islamic University of Medina, Al-Azhar University, or Umm Al-Qura University, or Jamia Malik Saud University, or any of these Islamic universities, you are going to go through a rigorous process. They're going to teach you how to research. They're going to teach you how to write papers. They're going to teach you how to write dissertations. If you go for your master's degree or you go for your PhD, you're going to write dissertations. You're going to write thesis. You understand? That prepares, that puts you in a mindset of learning how to go back and research information. And pre present information in a way that is anecdotal. Present information in a way that will remedy and provide solutions to a problem. That's what academia is all about. In the Muslim world, I can't speak for academia in the, in the secular world. But in the Muslim world, that is what academia is about. And all of these brothers who have gone to these random places and have, you know, so-called studied Islam, they don't have the formal teaching. They don't have the formal studying that comes with someone who went to a, a university. You follow me? So they don't have the slightest clue of how to make those type of connections. Doesn't Islam address or doesn't Tawheed address our social cultural issues? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it takes a certain type of student to be able to make that connection. And most of those brothers don't know how to do that. So instead of telling you and saying, hey, this is I've reached my I've reached my head. I've reached my limit in terms of my knowledge. Most of you brothers and sisters, the reason why they continue to recycle the same classes over and over again. Let me tell you why. You want to know why they continue to recycle the same classes over and over again? Number one, because that is the extent of their Islamic knowledge. They don't they can't give you anything beyond that. And number two is because they know that you have exhausted all of their knowledge. If you sat with any one of those brothers for a year, you would exhaust all of their knowledge. You would exhaust all of their knowledge. You would absorb everything that they can offer you. Evidenced by the fact that they continue to recycle the same classes over and over again. They keep recycling the same classes. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself, why do they keep recycling the same classes? Is it because they love the subject so much? No, it's because that's what they feel comfortable teaching. And that is the extent of their knowledge. That is the extent of their knowledge. Their knowledge does not extend beyond that. That is their academic cap. That is their academic ceiling. If I could even say academic that is their ceiling. They can't give you anything more than that. They can, right, that's how far they can take you. They cannot take you any further. And so once you sat with them for a year, this is why many brothers and sisters, they go to Germantown, they go to um, Mookbill, or they go to Ibn Bass, or whatever 
cellophane master that's out there. You go there for a year. You sit in all of their classes. After a year, there is nothing else that they can teach you. Wallahi, I promise you. There's nothing else that they can teach you. They cannot teach you any more than that. All you have to do is sit with them for a year. Sit in all of their classes for an entire year. You will exhaust all of their knowledge. Because they don't actually have any knowledge. They don't actually have any knowledge. They're opening a book, reading to you what a sheikh said in the book. That's it. That's not knowledge. That is not knowledge. That is the extent of what they have of Islamic information. Instead of them just humbling themselves and saying, hey, this is how far I can take you. If you want more knowledge or more subjects or more, you know, more sciences in Islam that is beyond what I have the ability to give you, then you can look at some of the other imams around the city. But I cannot give you anything more. You can't digest them for a year. <laughs> They literally just open a book and tell, regurgitate to you what the shake and the shake is saying here and what the shake is saying here. That's not teaching. That's not teaching. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Habibi. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan. That's not teaching. They're not teaching you anything. Do you know what actually a teacher does? A teacher takes you to Darun, shayin for shayin, step by step by step, right? Gives you the information in a way that is anecdotal. Give you the information in a way where you can begin applying those principles. Give it to you in chunks and in pieces whereby you can see yourself growing, scaffolding, right? Ex exactly, Sister Verlena, scaffolding up. But what they are doing is giving you scaffolding down because after you exhaust all of their knowledge, all of their information of the religion, they hold you. How do they hold you? How do they hold you? Question. They won't let you go. They're going to hold you because their fear is you're going to leave me. So how do they hold you? Someone tell me. How do they keep you? How do they hold you? They hold you by warning you from going and sitting and learning from anybody else. Oh, this brother's, you know, he's a muptedir, he's an innovator, don't sit with him, don't take from him, don't take from him. He's a straight, scholars warned against him, scholars warned against him, Sheikh Fulan warned against him, stay away from him, don't listen to him, don't take from him, he's ignorant. So the only person left is who? Me. They hold you because they are afraid that after you have exhausted all of the information that they have, you're going to leave them and go sit and learn from somebody else. So in order to protect themselves from losing their relevance, they got to hold you by warning you from everybody. That's exactly what America does when they don't want you to go outside of the country and spend your money outside of the country. So they'll say, don't go to Mexico. Mexico is this. Don't go to the Bahamas because Bahamas is this. They're fighting in Jamaica. Don't go to Jamaica. Have you all afraid and scared to go outside of America so you can stay right here, spend your vacation in America, go into these nasty disgusting hotels that they call five-star hotels. Freaking disgusting. You ought to be ashamed of yourself calling this a five-star hotel. But this is what America does. America wants you to keep the money here in America. So they instill fear in you. Of what's going on in Mexico? What's going on in Jamaica? What's going on in Bahamas? What's going on over here and over there? So you stay right here. Spend your money right here. Take your spring break right here. Keep your money right here. <laughs> right. And the Salafis do the same thing. Don't sit with this brother. He's, he's a jahil. He's ignorant. He's this. He's that. Scholars warned against him. Don't do this. Don't, don't sit with that person. So you stay right there. Out of fear. You're afraid. 
You're afraid. You don't know how many people are afraid to listen to me. They have done a number on your psyche. They have done a number on your psyche. Some people, I don't listen to him. And you've never actually even heard a lecture of mine. You've never actually even heard a lecture of mine. But you'll say, oh, I don't take from him. I don't listen to him. He's a deviant. It's like, have you ever even listened to him? <laughs> nope. It is brainwashing at its finest. Brainwashing at its finest. Sad, man. You know, it's, it's really sad. But in a nutshell, that's exactly what you're dealing with. Because you're dealing with people who cannot. The, Hassan al-Basri, one of the great scholars out in here, he said, Rahim Allah, may Arafa qadra nafsa. Hassan al Basri, he said, May Allah have mercy on the person who knows his own limitations. You have to know when you have been exhausted, when you are outside of your league. When you have ventured outside of your league, sometimes people come to me and ask me, can you give a lecture on this and give a lecture on that? And I'll be the first person to tell you that's not my thing. Brother came to me after Juma last week and was like asking me about Reba, asking me about finances, mortgage and stuff like that. Can you do a lecture series on that? That's not my thing. I had a whole semester on Reba on the chapter of interest. I failed. I had to take that I had to take that course all over again the next semester cuz I failed. I'm I'm not good when it comes to that. Calculating this and that and this uh, technical terms and things like that was above my my pay grade. I barely made it graduate. I barely passed the next semester when I took it again because it was part of the core curriculum. So I had to pass it in order to move on to the next semester. I failed it the first time. So when the brother came to me and said, you know, can you do a lecture on finances and, you know, Islamic, you know, finances and things? No, that's not my thing. No, not my thing. Not my thing. I would never give a lecture on that. I would never give a lecture on that. Out of my lane. I said, go see my man, Joe Bradford. That's that's the finance, Islamic finance guru. One of the finest ones I know, graduate from the Islamic University, not to mention the universities that he went to here in America. You want you want Islamic knowledge on finances and halal investment? Go see Joe Bradford. He's that guy. But I would never string a person along to prove to them that I have knowledge in an area that I don't have knowledge in. I don't, I don't get any cool points for that. I don't get any relevance for that. I'm going to pass it on to the person that I know that is, you know, that is a professional in that, in that realm. His name is Joe Bradford. Joe Bradford. You can catch him on Instagram. Catch him. He's a graduate from the university. He was in the university when we was there. Him, yeah, so Kaldi, they were all, you know, they were all contemporaries during that time. I came a little bit later and I kind of caught them before they graduated. But Joe, he's that he's that guy. He's that guy. I message him when I have questions about finances and things that come to me. I, I message him. Yo, do you have it? You know, can you direct me? Whatever the case may be. Or I'll send people to him here. Here's his here. His handle. Go ask him. Because that's that's out of my league. I'm not going to speak about matters that I don't have any knowledge about. That's our deen. And these brothers, they obviously don't understand that because they are constantly speaking about matters they have absolutely no knowledge about. Dr. Tar here. That's my man. We were in the university together. He got there long before I was there, but he lived around the corner from me. That was my man. Even now to this day, People send me messages. Go ask Dr. Tar here. I don't know. Go ask Dr. Tar here. He might be a better person to address that than I am. 
Not that I can't, but I feel more comfortable with them going to him, getting the information from him. Absolutely. Things that are out my lead, that are, that are above my pay grade, I'm going to pass it on. No, I'm not going to deal with that. These brothers obviously don't understand that. They didn't get the memo because that's also something that we were taught in the university. <laughs> that's also something that we were taught in the Islamic university. Dr. Tarhir, what is his specialty? He has a lot of specialties, man. The brother is, is extremely intelligent, man. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. The brother's extremely intelligent, man. And, and pretty much, he knows a little bit about a lot, right? One of those type of people is very few, very few subject matters that you can ask him about that he's not going to be able to give you something about it. Very few. He's one of those people, jack of all trades, man. He's He has knowledge about pretty much every single subject that you can ask him about. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Very few times that subject matter has come up or a conversation has come up, except that he always got, he always has some type of knowledge about it, can point you in the direction of a book or point you in the direction of statement of a scholar, something to give you more clarity on it. Any advice on what to do when all these games are being played and being overwhelmed, focused academically? You do what the scholars used to do during that time. You drain the scholars and the people of knowledge in your environment for whatever you can. And once you have drained them, then you move on to people beyond that. So I no longer have to listen to this person and that person anymore because I've exhausted all of your knowledge. There's not really much that you can say that I haven't already heard you say. So I've once I've exhausted all of your knowledge, then I move on to people of knowledge that have more than you. You understand? That's what that's why scholars used to travel. Imam Bukhari and Fulan and Fulan from amongst the ulama. They used to travel because they exhausted all of the knowledge of the scholars in their area. And now it's like, all right, I've there's nothing that this guy can teach me anymore. So now I need to move on and travel to where some other scholars are. So I can learn from them. That's broadening your, your, your bandwidth, your academic bandwidth, broadening your academic bandwidth. Once you have exhausted all of the knowledge of the scholars in your area, not really much that they can teach you anymore. You've, you've pretty much exhausted all of their information because they were limited. And now you move on. Like, I don't necessarily listen to them anymore. I, I can pretty much tell you every lecture that they've given. I can pretty tell you every, everything that they talk about. Now it's time for me to move on to scholars that have more knowledge than that. Otherwise, you are going to stay stuck. You're going to have a cap. You're going to have a ceiling that you cannot move beyond. The scholars, they say, if you want to know the mistakes of your sheikh, go sit with somebody other than him. Because you'll never be able, when you see, when you sit with a scholar for too long, that person becomes the end all be all for you. And that person can't do any wrong and can't say anything wrong in your eyes until you go sit with another scholar. And then you're like, oh, shoot. Now you can see all the mistakes of your sheikh because you're sitting with somebody else now. Somebody who has more knowledge than he has. Somebody who has more knowledge than he has. You couldn't see the flaws and the mistakes in your sheikh because he was the end all be all for you. But when you sit with someone else, now you get a chance to see. And this is why they warn against everybody. Don't sit with this one. Scholars warn against one because their fear is that if you sit with someone else, you're going to be able to see how ignorant they really are. That is part of their fear. And why they warn you against sitting with other people, because the fear is that if you sit with someone else, you're going to really get a chance to see how ignorant they really are. Yeah, that's a fact. Why would I encourage you to go sit with this brother when I know this brother has more knowledge than I do? And perhaps by sitting with him, you're going to be able to come back and contradict a lot of the things that I told you. Absolutely. 
So men who come to the masjid should be banned from coming or should they be checked on their attire? Uh, there's some instances where a person needs to be banned from the masjid. Or maybe not necessarily banned in that he can't come back, but he has to leave. Put you out of the masjid. Absolutely. If a brother comes to the masjid smelling like marijuana, you got to go. We're putting you out of the masjid. If I smell marijuana on you, you're going to be put out the masjid. That's a fact. If I'm at the masjid, you got to go. You got to go. That's not to say you can't come back. But in this moment, smelling like marijuana, we cannot permit you to sit on the musalla and infringe on the spiritual experience that everybody is having with Jumu'ah. Can't allow that. Sorry. And the thing is, is that we're tough for the wrong reasons. We're tough with people we don't need to be tough with. And we let stuff slide when we need to be more assertive with that type of behavior. Somebody come in the masjid with a poo shiesty on, a mask on, man, take the mask off. Why are you coming in the masjid with a mask on? I tell my own sons, 15 year old, he come the poo shiesty on, man, take that crap off. We're not going in the masjid with that on your head. Take that crap off of your head, man. Right, first of all, when you get in the car with me, take that off your head. I, I'm Generation X. I grew up in a completely different generation. Wearing a ski mask had other implications. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Like, y'all just randomly walking around with a ski mask on. Like, come on, man. Gotta be kidding me, man. Take that crap off, man. Not going nowhere with me. My sons already know. We get in the car, man. Take that crap off your head, man. He ain't going nowhere with it. It is 80 degrees outside. You got on a daggone ski mask, man. Take that crap off your head, man. Not going nowhere with me like that, man. I, I grew up in I grew up in the 80s and 90s, man. It was it was chaotic in the hood during that time. Nobody walking around with no ski mask on. You just randomly putting a ski mask on, walking in the store with me. Man, take that crap off, man. You're not going nowhere with me with that one. And that's the problem. They don't have parents to try to correct that. They don't have a man in their life that told them that that's not the proper attire. Because the fact of the matter is that you wouldn't have walked up in the courthouse with a poo shiesty on. If you walked up in the courthouse and the bailiff told you, you'll take that mask off, you'd have took it off. But you come in the masjid, we tell you to take it off because you're making people uncomfortable. I ain't taking my mask off. All right, well, then you got to go. <laughs> Get out the masjid. Why in the world, why would you ever feel compelled to come to a masjid with a ski mask on? And people can say, well, people should be free to wear whatever they want to wear. Sure, not in the masjid. So tell your story walking. You don't get no sympathy from me for that type of behavior. Ignorant behavior doesn't get sympathy. Especially not when you make other people in the masjid uncomfortable. Unfortunately, no. You don't get to make people uncomfortable at the expense of your convenience. It's convenient for you because you want to wear it, but you're making everybody else uncomfortable. Nah. Not at all. Not at all. So anybody who says, oh, he should be able to, oh, now you're trying to gatekeep what people can wear and you're trying to stop people from coming in. Absolutely. I make no qualms. I make no bones about that. Absolutely. 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 <laughs> so, inshallah, to add, I got to stop here. I could keep going with you guys on and on and on. Uh, but... This is the part of the night where it kind of gets a little real. And that is the fundraiser part of our Friday night. As you guys know that uh, we have been collecting money for our demolition project uh, at the masjid here in, in uh, Newark, Delaware. So, alhamdulillah, we were trying to collect in the area of $9,300. We've collected roughly around $7,000. $7,000. So we need in the area of between twenty three to twenty five hundred dollars. All right. I'm I'm 100 percent positive that we can raise that between now and nine fifteen. Nine minutes, nine minutes 
I believe that we can raise $2,500 in nine minutes. Alhamdulillah, whatever you can donate, alhamdulillah. $2,500 in nine minutes. That means I need 25 people to donate $100. Or one person to just say, hey, I'm going to just send you the whole send you the whole uh, 2,500. I'm going to just send you the whole 2,500 and we can be done with it. But it's 9.07, 9.15, inshallah ta'ala. I want to check and make sure that we've collected what we needed, alhamdulillah. Small lump sum just to finish this project off, inshallah ta'ala, so we can be um, we can be free to go ahead and demolish the building, bi'idhanillahi ta'ala. Uh, there was a couple of trees that we needed to plant and there were some, some things that we needed to do to make sure that um, everything was um, everything was set for the demolition. So um, we needed ninety three hundred dollars to you know pay off the things that we need to pay off. Uh, you can use our Cash App or you can use our Zelle or PayPal. The Cash App is the Cash App sign Rolda Islamic Center R A W D A H Islamic Center. Our Zelle is the Masjid's phone number, which is three zero two. 7665389. I'll post that here if you want to use Zell. Uh it's the message's phone number 302-766-5389. That is if you want to use Zell, you can use the message's phone number. The Cash App is the Cash App sign Rova Islamic Center. R A W D A H Rova Islamic Center. We need to collect $2,500, which I believe we can do that tonight. And that will help us to finish off our uh, demolition project, inshallah. So I pinned our um, cash app here. If you would like to use PayPal, then our PayPal is our email. And that is Rola Islamic Center of Delaware at gmail.com. If you want to use um, PayPal, Rova Islamic Center of Delaware at gmail.com. So we need 25 people to donate $100. And don't let the $2,500 be our the place where we stop, right? Because we still need, you know, funds to help out with, you know, um, other things that we have going on. Once we demolish the building, alhamdulillah, we want to begin with construction on the building uh, we were trying to get the de demolition done before we left for Umrah. We leave on Thursday for Umrah, inshallah ta'ala. Um, and so hopefully, uh, um, I, don't, I don't know if we'll ha have time to have it done by Thursday. Nonetheless, that was the plan to have it done by Thursday. They just planted the trees two days ago, the trees that we needed to make sure that we get the uh, inspection approval. Uh, and then one, once that happens, inshallah ta'ala, then we'll be free to demolish the building. All right. There's a there's a building that sits on the property that we are demolishing um, and we're knocking the building down so that we can build the masjid from the ground up. This is historic. Um, this is uh, no PayPal. is Yes, that's it. Roll the Islamic Center of Delaware at Gmail dot com. Yes, that's the that's the um, for the PayPal. Yes, that's correct. That is correct, brother. MashaAllah, watching from Africa, Ivory Coast. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. May Allah reward you, brothers, as well. Yes, the number that I pinned here is the Zell. If you want to use Zell, alhamdulillah, that is our pin. That is the, the number to use for Zell. The Cash App is Rola Islamic Center of Delaware. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan. Uh, for everyone who donated, we have about four minutes left, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, let me check the um, cash app and see what's, how much we collected so far. Um, okay, so in the cash app so far is $1,200. $1,200 in the cash app so far. So... We have 1,200 in the cash app so far. It's 2 a.m. in Morocco. MashaAllah, appreciate you, Sister Monique. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Must be beautiful in Morocco. Alhamdulillah. Uh, 
I can tell you if I was not building this masjid, I would probably be on the first thing smoking with my family to the nearest Islamic country, <laughs> whether that is Saudi Arabia, Morocco, or UAE. I would definitely be out of here. And I definitely encourage any of the Muslims that are living here, if you can move to another country, move out of this country, take your family and go. Take your family and go. <laughs> take me. <laughs> Mashallah. Yeah, man. Take your family and go. Alhamdulillah, we're at 1600 in the cash app. 1600 in the cash app. We need $900 more. Nine more people to donate $100. Come on, brothers and sisters. We can do this. Nine people. Nine people to donate a hundred dollars. Come on, we can do this. If you can take your family and move out of here, take your family and go. Here's something I'm going to share with you guys. Um, the Zell is our phone number 302. Take the number down. 302-766- 5389 302-766-5389 Here's something I'm going to share with you guys. Uh I saw a movie last week. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this movie that just came out. You know, after Ramadan, we're trying to catch up on what's going on in the world because you'd be out of it. Uh, during Ramadan, so uh, you be kind of detached. So as Ramadan is over, you're trying to come into the back into the world to figure out what's going on. So there's this movie that came out. Um, it's called Civil War. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but uh, I don't take things like that lightly. And it's basically a movie about how uh, society begins to rebel against the government. And how uh, different parts of America begin to sign out of, you know, this whole United States concept and become independent states. And they go against the government and they're fighting and they're shooting, you know, government officials, the army. And it's just it's chaos, chaos. And I looked at that and it, it scared the crap out of me because, you know, they don't usually put stuff like that in movies except that something is brewing and something is probably leading up to that. And conspiracy theorists would call it a conspiracy or a conspiracy theory. Uh, I don't necessarily believe that there's consp conspiracy, you know, conspiracies. I believe there's truth and there's not truth. And after seeing that and then looking at what's happening on the college campuses, because they don't tell you in the movie how that that civil war started. They don't they don't go to the backstory. They just kind of start you where it is and what's actually happening. You know, and I'm looking at what's happening in, you know, around the world with the, 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 the protests on the on the college campuses. And, you know, what's happening in Texas and Florida and, you know, them separate, you know, and you literally see this playing out right in front of you. And you're, you, it, it makes you wonder is what hap what is happening on these college campuses right now? Is this the starting place for that? Is this how it starts? That's 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 the question. It's just like because the movie doesn't highlight the backstory and how it started. It starts you from it happening to you know journalists trying to capture everything and they're running around with their cameras and you know they end up getting killed trying to you know one of the main. A uh, couple of the, the the journalists get killed, you know, trying to document what, what is happening. And they actually capture the president and kill the president. You know what I mean? The, the name of the movie is Civil War. It's in the movie theaters right now. And you got to pay attention. God, keep your finger on the pulse and pay attention to what's going on in the world, man. I don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe that that movie came out and then... At the time that it came out and you see everything you see going on around you. I don't believe in coincidences. Man. 
So right now we are at 2300 on the Zelle, uh, on the uh, on the cash app. So alhamdulillah, we're just about there. Um, we're at the 2300 mark on cash app. And we've had some um, some uh, deposits uh, that were made on Zelle. So, um, yeah, alhamdulillah, I appreciate you guys coming through. Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. So we're at 2300 on the cash app. Can we get seven more people to donate $100 to put us at three grand? Can we get seven more people to donate $100? The Zell is pinned right here. 302-766-5389. Cash app is the cash app sign, Rolda Islamic Center, R-A-W-D-A-H, Rolda Islamic Center. Can we get seven more people to donate $100 and cap it off at 3000 Seven more people to donate $100 that cap us off at 3000 Alhamdulillah. We've collected what we needed to finish off the demolition project. Alhamdulillah. Seven more people to donate $100. Come on, brothers and sisters. Look at your Cash App. Look at your PayPal. Look at your Zelle. See if you can pinch off another 100 Bismillah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place it in your scales of good on the day that you're going to need it the most. I don't know if you guys have seen the flyer for um, our marriage retreat. We have our annual marriage retreat. Uh marriage retreat which is coming up in november inshallah ta'ala we will we, we'll be at uh crystal i can't i can't remember the name of it but uh alhamdulillah we had one person donate a hundred dollars we need six more people to donate a hundred dollars inshallah uh what are you talking about the for the um cash app the cash app is the cash app sign Rolda. Islamic Center. Yes, Crystal Springs. Sorry about that. <laughs> Crystal Springs. Alhamdulillah. That's in uh that's in New Jersey. Yes, we do have spots for singles. We have 10 spots for singles. Alhamdulillah. We have 10 spots for singles and we have 20 spots for couples. Crystal Springs Resort. And that's this November, November 15th to the 17th. We have Sister Zafira who will be with us, alhamdulillah. We have Imam Akil Ingram who will be with us. And we have one more person, inshallah ta'ala, that's going to remain a surprise for the couples, inshallah ta'ala. And so for couples and singles. So if you are single and you want to come and attend some of the workshops and attend some of the... Um, uh, no, you don't need a guardian. You don't You don't need your wedding. Unless you, you, you're coming to get married, then that's a different 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 conversation but if you just come in to attend the workshops then you don't you don't necessarily need your wali unless you feel comfortable bringing him with you uh, but if you want to attend the workshops you want to attend you know the seminars and things like that the workshops the discussions inshallah ta'ala um come out and benefit yeah we we kind of toyed around with the idea of uh doing it in morocco going to morocco but i don't i don't know if um I don't know if the brothers and sisters are ready to take that leap. Um, that's that's uh, that's a price. That's a heavy price tag to put, you know, for for couples. And uh, I don't I don't know. We would have to test drive that first before uh, before we could uh, before we could do that. But we did toss around the idea of doing it uh, in Morocco. So we had three people donate a hundred dollars. We need four more people in Charlotte. How do you attain a spot for you and your wife? You can go directly to our website, www.rollaislamiccenterofdelaware.com. And you can register directly on our website. Alhamdulillah. You don't have to make the whole payment now. You can make a uh, deposit and then you can make payments. Uh, but we would like to have all the payments in by September, inshallah ta'ala. We have halal food. We have a huge dinner on Saturday night. Anybody that attended our last marriage retreat in the Poconos knows that, you know, alhamdulillah, we have a, a, a Saturday night dinner. We have entertainment, halal entertainment. And uh, the couples, they absolutely enjoy getting dressed up. Everybody get dressed up. We have like a nice ball. You get dressed up and you come out. And alhamdulillah, we have a reward for the, the best dress couple. Alhamdulillah. And we really have a good time. And we, we learn some tools. We walk away with some tools to help us better our marriages. To go back to the marriage and begin, you know, creating. Creating that, 
you know, creating that that blissful place that we're all looking for in our marriages. The Poconos weren't very accommodating. We had some issues with the lady at the front desk. Some of the rooms were, you know, were not up to par. And I, we just thought that with the amount of money that we were spending, we could do a lot better. And alhamdulillah, we found Crystal Springs Resort. And alhamdulillah, they have been so accommodating to us, man. Alhamdulillah, halal, halal breakfast, halal dinner. There's so many amenities. If you go to their website, you can see all of the amenities. There's an indoor pool, outdoor pool, heated pool. Oh man, so much. So alhamdulillah, it was such a blessing that we came across this property. And um, inshallah ta'ala, uh, you know, you guys are more than welcome to join us, inshallah ta'ala. I think the fee for um, singles is 1060 and the fee for couples is, I think, like 14 something uh, or 15 something. I can't remember the prices. Nonetheless, that is for, for three days. That's Friday, Saturday, and then, of course, Sunday. And if you decide you want to stay longer than that, you're more than welcome. But for the days that we will be there, we will be there for those amount of days. That is November 15th to the 17th. Alhamdulillah. So if you want to register and make payments all the way up until the time, you can go to our website right now and you can register for you and your spouse. All right. Or you can register for you yourself if you're coming as a single person to get some tools, to get some benefit, inshallah ta'ala, and to spend time with, you know, married couples and people who are there that perhaps you can walk away from some jewel with some jewels or some gems that can help you along your journey, inshallah ta'ala. It's beautiful being around married couples, being around people who have experience in being married. And so you can absorb a lot of that. You know, if you're a single person, you shouldn't be hanging around single people. As a single person, you shouldn't be hanging around single people. Hang around married people so you can figure out, crack the code and figure out what the heck worked for them that, that didn't work for you and begin implementing that. That's how you benefit. It's like a person who's young, but you hang around older people. As, as a young person, you don't want to hang around people your age because you're not going to really benefit from people or your age. You want to hang around people that are older than you so you can get the benefit and so as a single person, you don't want to hang around single people. You want to hang around people that are married so you can get the benefit. So uh, one more check on the cash app. Um, we're at 25. So we basically need five more people to donate $100. Uh, I'm not going to hold you guys any longer. Alhamdulillah. Uh, someone else just sent in uh, Sister Shayla. Sent in $100, alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. So that puts us at 2600 on the cash app. So we need four more people to donate $100, inshallah ta'ala. That'll put us at three grand on the cash app uh, in addition to what we've collected on the Zell. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all and place it in your scales of good on the day that you will need it, emo need it the most. You guys have been great. I enjoy you know, spending this time with you. I can't think of a better way to spend my Friday nights. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. Um, you guys are, are truly appreciated and I will keep you guys posted. And I will stream the demolition of the building live because that is going to be something that I enjoy watching. Us tearing down a building that non-Muslims put up so that we can build a building for the Muslims. Alhamdulillah. Build a masjid for the Muslims. Is it permissible for women to travel to the resort alone? It all depends on where you're traveling from. It all depends on where you're traveling from. If you're traveling from New Jersey, North Jersey, or if you're traveling from Philly, I, I don't I wouldn't necessarily consider that traveling. If you're traveling from like DC or you're traveling from Virginia and you gotta come all the way up, you know, like four, five, six hours, um, yeah, you might wanna you might wanna have someone with you, you know, have someone with you and not necessarily traveling by yourself, especially you know, at night. But if you're traveling during the day, uh, inshallah ta'ala, as long as you, you're on FaceTime and you got, you know, your cell phone and, you know, it's easy for you to keep people posted uh, uh, as to your whereabouts, inshallah ta'ala, then I, I don't necessarily see an issue with that, you know, but always have someone with you, you know, if a sister, two sisters, you guys can travel together, or if you got your husband and you can travel with your husband, you have a son, then, you know, you can bring your son with you, you know, he can stay in the hotel room while you attend the, the lectures or the workshops, but, you know, if that's, you know, um, if that's what makes you more comfortable, then please do what makes you more comfortable and what is closer to pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I would never want to encourage anyone to do something that would be disobedient or displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. Jazakum Allah khairan. I wouldn't consider traveling from Philly to South Jersey. Um, 
you know, to, to be traveling. I, w I wouldn't consider that or nor closer to North Jersey. I wouldn't consider that traveling. That's like a two hour hike. That's that's not, you know, I don't I wouldn't necessarily consider that traveling. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah knows best. When it comes to Medina University, at what stage does an individual does a thesis or dissertation in their studies? Well, the thesis um, or, or the master's dissertation is what you do when, well, you do a thesis when you're going, when you're graduating with your master's degree. But as for dissertation, you do that at the end of the year. You every, in order to graduate and finish the university, you have to write a dissertation. You have to write a thesis at the end of your studies or research. Even in the even in the bachelor's program, even in the undergraduate program, you still have to write a thesis before you graduate. I posted a picture of, of my thesis, my graduate thesis or my thesis for my undergrad. Uh, I posted it on my Instagram page. I was going through some papers maybe a couple months ago when I saw I, I found it. You know, it was it was a bot. It was a research paper that I, I wrote on moving the finger in the salat. I wrote one on moving the finger in the salat and I wrote another one on on something uh, on marriage or subject on marriage. Yeah, but you, you have to write a thesis before you graduate. I posted it on my Instagram page just there in all Arabic. I had to type it up in Arabic. Yeah. And that research is what prepares you to learn how to gather information, structure information and be able to present it. You know, the, the research is in all Arabic, so you would need to, you, you know, you would need to um, learn how you, you would need to know how to read Arabic in order to see the. I only posted the cover of it and the date that I wrote it. Yeah. But Jazakumullah Khairan, inshallah ta'ala, until we meet again, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you all safe and uh, always keep your head on the swivel, always be mindful of your surroundings and what's going on around you. And uh, inshallah ta'ala, always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his protection, for indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is waliyu thalika wa qadirun ala kulli shay. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salama tasliman kathira. Wa subhanaka rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.